to see everyone. I'm going to try and see if I can get more faces here up on our screen. You can use your camera lovely. If not lovely, show up however you feel most comfortable. I'm Jamie. Um, we're here. I'm here with one of my dearest friends and family members, really, Diana Mena on occupied Puyallup and Coast Salish land, um, also known as Federal Way, Washington. I am an indigenous social worker and therapist. My lineage is Yakima Nation and affiliated tribes and bands. I am a trauma healer and a third generation educator. So I love talking with people about our medicine and our birthright to it and healing in general. I am also a mother a queer mother and proud of it to a four-year-old. His name is Joel. And to a 20-week uh, relative in my uterus currently. Um, so very happy to share some of my story about that and uh, some of my uh, medicine that I've used to manage many years of infertility trauma. So I'm happy to be here with her today. Mm -hmm. My turn. Uh, hello, everyone. Bienvenidos. Um, my name is Diana Mena. Uh, she and her pro, uh, pronouns and my people originate from the country of Nicaragua in Central America. I am a first generation Nicaraguan American. My mother and father immigrated here in the late 80s, um, fleeing the consequences of um, the revolution and um, the militarization of our borders. Um, I have been raised here in Seattle, well, in Seattle for um, most of my life. And um, I am a clinical healer. I am a healer in my lineage. Um, I am breaking cycles. I have been uh, since birth, since in womb. Um, I am a clinical activist and a therapist. And I'm sitting beside my best friend in the world. Um, so we're here to share a lot of emotion, bring you into uh, the most vulnerable parts of ourselves, um, and hopefully continue our healing journey and, and bring you along with it. Um, so thank you very much for having us and for the invitation. Yes. And we want you to feel like you can participate in this conversation. We're here to learn from you as well. So please feel free to unmute if you need to pause us and check in with something or ask the question or throw something in the chat. We'll do our best to be monitoring anything. Um, any reflections you might have or feedback, we really welcome mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, so we'd like to start just by doing a grounding exercise. I know we're a, a ball of butterflies because we're so excited to be in a space together. Mm -hmm. um, to share our medicine with the world and also um, to share our medicine with you all. Um, so we're deeply honored. So let's just take a couple seconds um, to burn some medicine and say a prayer. So feel free to ground yourself wherever you may be. Um, put your feet firmly on the floor if you're able, uh, your hands, on your body, in your lap, if you feel comfortable. Um, and just to reconnect to your oldest ancestor, uh, mm -hmm. your breath, right? This breath that has accompanied us from um, as soon as we came into this world and, and crossed over and um, it has accompanied us every step of the way. And it's here with us now. I'm taking a deep breath. And with that breath, we honor all the sacred parts of ourselves. We honor the medicine that's always present. We honor the world, the land, and the roots that take us back all the way to our ancestors, that connect us to our ancestral knowledge and forward 
towards the followers of our lineage, the people that will come, our descendants. We thank them for their strength, for their trust, and for our communal resiliency, for our ongoing existence. May we all be grounded, rooted, and free. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Mateo. Diana is also the first time mother of a one-year-old mm -hmm. Zilonen, mm -hmm. my beautiful niece. Mm -hmm. um, we have our babies here. <laughs> You might hear so them. <laughs> they may make an appearance, although we have beautiful community helping us with childcare today. But we, you know, are living intergenerationally. So mm -hmm. let's get started. Yeah. All right. Um, so in introduction, just to let you know, um, Jamie and I met um, at un the University of Washington as um, during our master's in social work. Um, and Jamie was kind of hiding in the corner um, and I knew that she was my person. So mm -hmm. I walked over and I introduced myself. I asked her if she was native and indigenous. I was like, okay, we're friends. <laughs> um, and since then it's been a loving um, partnership. Um, mm -hmm. We've been mothers to each other. Yeah. Um, we've healed so many, uh, so much of our mother wounds together yeah. um, before children even existed. And then as we brought life into the world, and it's been an ongoing practice of healing ourselves beside each other um, and healing each other as we um, birth these babies and, and send them off uh, to do their own healing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing that you claimed me because of my trauma. I didn't believe that I could have deep loving relationships with other women i had i had had them but nothing like i've experienced with diana and then sense with other people because of diana's medicine and your beautiful gift of family building so mm -hmm. she dragged me along and i made it <laughs> yeah. um so a lot of our wounding starts way back about 500 years ago um wherein our lands were colonized and um uh, deep genocide was committed against our peoples. Uh, so my family comes from Granada, uh, which is uh, the oldest um, colonial city in Central America. Um, and so um, the Spanish came around 1515 15, um, and began um, colonizing. So my connection to uh, being indigenous is one of reclamation um, because it's over the 500 years of survival um, it's been um, difficult to retrace these roots and, and find a specific tribe and a people, mm -hmm. um, but it's important for me to reclaim that and pass it on mm -hmm. um, in my Ceylon. And so um, yeah. we wanted to start off by talking a little bit about that and introducing the topic of historical trauma mm -hmm. and how that turns into intergenerational trauma. Yes, and, and particularly how historical trauma and the, the trauma of genocide was designed to directly disrupt our caregiving relationships with our, you know, the descendants of our womb, but also our kinship relationships with all of our relatives. Mm -hmm. And this was by design. So my tribe in its beautiful resourcefulness mm -hmm. and um, just incredible capacity for survival signed a treaty in 1855 to keep access to our ancestral homelands and as a result lost innumerable relationships, right? It, it, we celebrate our treaties and they're a story of our losses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, historical trauma, when I think about how it intersects with my womb in particular, I almost don't have words to fully grasp the grief there. And the loss and that was that was by design right so um a lot of my reconnection to my womb has been about claiming that story for my lineage claiming that story of loss and grief and all of the beautiful ways we've survived but all of the all of the pain and shame that we've also had to live with um 
and as a cycle breaker, <laughs> I, uh, my role in that story of historical trauma is one of medicine for this, you know, not only the seven generations to come, but the seven generations that came before me. Um, and to, yeah, just believe in my, my, my right to our healing. Mm -hmm. And, and our birthright to the lineage. Yeah. Um, because I think for a lot of us, we struggle with identity, we struggle with language, um, with calling ourselves indigenous, with reclaiming the medicine um, and feeling like it belongs to us. Mm -hmm. And that too was an intentional systematic um, intervention so that we would be interrupted and disconnected um, from the historical legacy and medicine of our ancestors. Yeah. Absolutely. So what's historical trauma? Yeah, so historical trauma is all, the, all those things we've said and a whole mess of other stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is the intergenerational passing of, of, of these atrocities we've spoken of, of course, the genocidal loss, um, the loss of our, of our people, our land and our kinship relationships with our land and our more than human relatives. And it's a really, it's a real introduction, I think, into our lineages about, um, about how to feel ashamed of ourselves because we're not enough. We don't fit, fit, you know, fit this white supremacist colonial model of human even. Mm -hmm. um, for many of our tribal groups in Turtle Island, we've had lots of different ways to survive that shame. And that in, it, in and of itself then creates stories of disconnection. Um, for example, historical trauma for me as a mixed race indigenous person living as both colonizer and colonized, that relationship was, I was taught that that was a story of shame that was something to hide from, hide myself from and other people from. I was told that that was something, those two stories I cannot hold as one. That is a story of historical trauma for me. It's also profound disconnection from our ritual practices of healing. My people in particular are profound keepers of healing in innumerable ways. Prior to settler colonialism and after, and because of historical trauma, we hear all these messages about all of our deficits and wounds from colonialism. And instead of that full story of our access to our knowing, which is our knowing is about healing. And if we inherit historical trauma, we also inherit survivorship and wisdom and medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, go ahead. yeah, it always amazes me to think about how um, even in the worst of circumstances, our ancestors managed to save this medicine for us. Yeah. Uh, they managed to save the medicine and pass it down. Um, and we didn't even realize how they did it or what they did. Um, but it's here right? mm -hmm. and it's waiting for us to, to reclaim. Mm -hmm. um, so that spiritual wisdom is very, very present. Mm -hmm. Historical trauma is also an inheriting of participating in familiar patterns of survivorship that are both sacred, but continue to cause us harm. So a pattern that I am seeking to heal in my lineage right now is, um, how do I say this with good medicine in my heart? Mm. Is a reliance on the colonizer for safety whether that be uh, a relation, a partnership, or a marriage with somebody that's harmful, um, or a, re a relationship that's out of reciprocity with, with anything. I've seen my, um, you know, my matriarchal line give up a lot of their medicine just to survive. And part of healing that for the people who've come before me, these incredibly powerful indigenous women is saying, we have a right to peace and safety that's indigenous. And that has been not always the, let me just, it's not easy and it's been really painful, but 
even just watching my mom, she was a, a teenage mother. We're going to get to a little bit later about our histories with our own mothers, but her real challenge with being indigenous because of historical trauma and the intergenerational trauma, she always heard she wasn't enough in her indigenous identity. And I remember years ago, she's an incredibly gifted relative to plant medicine and herbal medicine. Just, it's just in her DNA. And I said, mom, you could grow medicine in a crack. Mm -hmm. Like you could grow it anywhere you went. And she said, and she just beamed with pride. Mm -hmm. And that was like, there it is. There's the, there's the intergenerational healing. We inherit that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why we're such powerful ancestors already. So such powerful elders, even in our youth, because um, for, for our parents and, and for our grandparents, we're the ones naming um, the strengths and resiliency of our indigenous selves and of our people. Um, and reminding them of who they were. And that's not always easy. Um, and it's not always um, welcomed by these same family members, but we keep bringing our medicine regardless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that bridges with the, um, the next um, definition we wanted to share around intergenerational trauma. Um, and I think Jamie has named some around um, disconnection, um, loss of medicine, loss of identity, loss of connection, loss of, um, mo of mothering, mm -hmm. of capacity, mm -hmm. ability, techniques of mothering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For my lineage in particular, uh, an inability to protect our daughters from harm um, and sometimes embodying that harm towards our daughters. Um, yep. There's a lot of... Um, uh, Residential schooling trauma is very present in my lineage. It's only a couple of generations away. And I have done a lot of um, very specific healing around that, around how anxious I feel as a mom. Literally, like somebody is, will take my son from me. I, I, and that is part of that intergenerational trauma that's passed down. Recently, he decided he wanted to start using the bus. I was like, like you can't go on the bus, like somebody will take you. But that was all here in my, it wasn't his to inherit. It was to stop here. I got permission from his grandmother and great grandmother, reluctant permission, but ultimately it was for me to not pass that on to him. And it was, I think it was the best day of his life and the worst day of mine. Um, but some of that stuff that that intergenerational trauma, you might, I realized I didn't even have words for mm -hmm. it because it happened to my ancestor's body mm -hmm. and, it, and it passed, you know, passed it down um, through, you know, our DNA and our ge genetic expression of how we even experience fear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I remember that morning before he took the bus, just shaking with fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, okay, I got to get my medicine out. I got to move through this, not ignore it, acknowledge this wound, this deep, profound wound and let my son live his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, um, uh, just to build on how intergenerational trauma isn't necessarily spoken or named. Um, and we sometimes don't have cognitive, um, right. a cognitive understanding of what happened to our people or it shows up as an embodied experience um, where there are no words, but like our body knows that something happened. Um, I was pregnant during um, 2020, so the first year of COVID um, and COVID made it possible for me to even consider um, having a child, but it also brought along with it its own grief and um, its own wounding. And so my first trimester, I was, I experienced such intense loneliness, mm -hmm. like deep, profound loneliness that I could not understand for the life of me. I could not explain, um, yeah. right? And it was so intense. And part of that was the pandemic. Yes, I'm alone when, for the first time in my life when I have all these sisters that I expected to be present for me during my pregnancy. Um, but it was so intense in ways that it didn't make sense yeah. because I chose this pregnancy 
Um, I immediately felt connected to my daughter. Um, I wanted her. I have a supportive, loving partner. I made this choice to birth this child. It, she wasn't a result of violence mm -hmm. um, for the first time in my lineage. Yeah. And so this isolation, this, this loneliness, this grief that I felt didn't make sense. And it wasn't until about my third trimester, the completion of my third trimester, that it, it hit me. Um, it took me, it even takes this mental health therapist or trauma therapist a while to catch up um, because this is an embodied experience sometimes, not, not the cognitive um, process um, that we're sold. But it wasn't until the completion of my third um, trimester that I realized that I made the connection that if it's histor if, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Mm -hmm. And I learned that from my teacher, Resna Manikin. Um, and so he was always very firm. If it's hysterical, it's historical. Mm -hmm. And what that meant that if it's overly exaggerated, if it feels so big, if it feels yeah. like uh, so heavy, consuming, you. consuming, yeah. um, you have to look back at your lineage yeah. to make that connection of who it belongs to. Mm -hmm. um, and in so many ways, I realized that this, this loneliness was my mother's experience with me when I was in her womb. Um, and when I realized that it was another grief process that had had to happen, but also it was so liberating to realize that this loneliness was not true for me, um, that it didn't belong to me and that I didn't have to carry that or pass it on to my child. Mm -hmm. And so medicine happened with that realization because I could put it back on my mother um, to heal her own loneliness. Um, and I could break that cycle before it got passed on um, to my daughter and my daughter's children. So that's what intergenerational trauma looks like in an embodied sense. Yeah. It's not just a theory. Yeah, exactly. Ways in which, I'm going to talk about a little, a little more how it's passed down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so trauma patterns are, are relational patterns, like any other type of patterns in our life. And I noticed for me, as I've tried to look back, as Dee has said, in this embodied way, why I keep hitting my, like my body keeps running into the same barriers for healing. Like I know this in my head, but why is my body not receiving it? And I think one of the reasons why is this intergenerational inheritance of sh deep shame about our indigenous bodies. Mm -hmm in our indigenous way of life. And I have given myself permission for that wound to heal. And it, you know, it's, it's, it really depends on who I'm, whom I'm with when I'm with in it, when I'm with indigenous med medicine and indigenous circle or ceremony, that healing is much quicker. It's like there, that's what it needs. Mm -hmm. And it's tough because I'm not always in, in that embodied space. So giving myself permission for that wound to feel more healed or deeper has been really liberating. I'm not rushing it, but shame is a prof is a profound wound for my lineage because of violence, residential schooling, sexual trauma, domestic violence, and addiction. addiction. And um, I don't want to shame that. I don't want to shame my shame <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, um, so it, it, it is passed down through shame. And what, what's important for that we want you to take away is that the medicine also comes with the wounding. Like it, it's not one or the other. Um, and so we inherited medicine and we also inherited wounding um, and both need to be tended to. And so shame is about survival, yeah. right? Shame, hiding ourselves, making ourselves small um, is all about protecting ourselves, right? It's about keeping ourselves safe because if we were big and bold and free, what might've happened to us, to our ancestors, it might've been a lot worse for us if we hadn't made ourselves small. And so shame is um, passed down um, through family secrets, right? through sweeping things under the rugs, uh, through silence, um, unprocessed grief, unprocessed sadness, 
and colonial thinking about these subjects, right? That make us feel bad and shame our shame um, rather than recognize how we have um, protected ourselves in order to be here today. Yeah, we're, we're taught to keep other people's secrets, mm -hmm. to keep all of us safe mm -hmm. and internalize that for many of us trauma survivors, being a childhood domestic violence survivor, a, a huge way and a sacred way I survived daily violence in my household was to believe that I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So that I could just be better, if I could just clean better, if I could just be a better student, if I could just show up in the religion that was forced on me, that it would be safer. Mm -hmm. And so these are profound patterns that get built over time. And I inherited them from the relatives that survived before me. And so to think that now that I know I don't want that pattern anymore, it doesn't mean it just goes away. <laughs> um, there's a comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Belen shared about um, feeling deeply into our experiences of mm. uh, their son being born in March mm. 20, oh, wow. just two days before my Ceylon. Um, oh no, two years in a year, two days in a year. Yeah. Uh, the fears and intrusive thoughts that caused me severe anxiety didn't make sense for a long time. And this brings me so much clarity and peace. Um, yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, both of us experienced anxiety postpartum. Ah, uh, severe. Yes. Um, and I remember multiple text threads with Jamie being <laughs> like, um, speaking of, of sexual trauma, yeah. um, I con come from a long lineage of, of sexual trauma, which is why it's so important for me to talk about secrets. Yeah. Because um, sexual childhood sexual abuse is something that happens almost every generation if it's not spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, and so we keep these secrets. Our grandmothers kept these secrets about the violence and, and abuse that they experienced. And then our mothers continued that. And then their daughters experienced um, the same type of, of abuse. And so it has been so important for me. Before I could even become a mother, I needed to process my experiences of sexual trauma um, and the lineage's experiences of sexual trauma, um, because it was crucial that before I brought a child into the world, um, I needed to shift out of that pattern. I needed to be protective and I needed to make sure that that cycle broke. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when, when my child was born, one of the biggest triggers for me was changing her diaper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I remember um, just texting Jamie and being like, what is wrong? Like, I, again, another embodied um, experience of intergenerational trauma where it was like, um, here's this little being who's so dependent and vulnerable um, and trusting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this anxiety that you're naming, Belen, for us, it, it was so real. Mm -hmm. It was so real. And, and um, being able to recognize who it belongs to and, and putting it back on them to do that work when we're not able um, is very crucial and important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember feeling a lot of anxiety and shame and not enoughness about around returning chest feeding to our lineage. Mm -hmm. I would, I would weep. I would just oh, sit there and weep. And, um, think about all that I was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And I had the people who came before me saying, I'll go get the formula. <laughs> <laughs> like ready to, to, to just keep me safe in the way that, you know, in, in the, in the colonial survival patterns, you know, and I just ultimately the beautiful thing about our wombs is they bring relatives from our ancestral lineages here, earth side. And I remember looking at him and I was like, I trust you. I trust you with this repair in our lineage. Mm -hmm. And he went on to nurse for two years, like all day, every day until he was done. He's a Virgo. So he was like, I'm done now. <laughs> um, oh, look at him. Oh, I see some Hi, baby. Hi. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I just, if it's hysterical, it's historical. That was, I thank you for that. Absolutely. And I, I want to name Elizabeth and Rhonda because in my chest feeding journey, um, 
different wounds were, were triggered as well. And um, so my mom got pregnant the day she crossed the border um, and she didn't know the language. She didn't know um, the place. She didn't know medicine. Um, and what's powerful is that my mom was badass enough to know that she wanted to be intentional having a child, but she left her birth control in Nicaragua. <laughs> and it, um, so along the journey, she, um, she had planned previously and then she lost that medicine and um, against her will, like she became pregnant. And um, so by the time she was ready to have me, she goes to the hospital and the nurse doesn't speak English. Um, it's a public hospital in Los Angeles. Um, there is no trauma-informed care. There is no cultural competency. Um, there's a lot of racism and classism that happens in those public hospitals. And my mother comes from a society that's um, virginity and purity of women is so highly prized mm -hmm. um, that she felt so much shame mm -hmm. in about her naked body. And um, all of the doctors were men and it was a student hospital. So they, there were all these men opening up her, um, opening up her legs to check her dilation and to study how like the birthing and labor process. And so my mom felt such deep shame about that experience. And then I was born and then the nurse tells her that she doesn't have enough milk. And so immediately passes a bottle of formula to her. Um, and my mom left that hospital and she's so resourceful that she stole the tiny little bottles, the glass bottles, and she didn't have any money. So she stole them in her little, in her little purse along with diapers um, to be able to feed me. Um, but that was, that was taken away from her. And um, Jamie had warned me that breastfeeding can be tough and that I needed to make it toward, uh, through the first two months in order for it to um, start to feel better. <laughs> and I was determined. But at week two, um, I had already suffered so much pain. Yeah. Like I had so much milk. The, the milk was such a lesson in abundance for yeah. me. Um, but Silo refused to latch. And that's the first, um, that should have been my first warning that I am, I have birthed a free daughter mm -hmm. um, because that girl is fierce and she refused. She was <laughs> impatient. Um, she, she did not want to engage. And I was determined, so that's my Aquarius, like I am very determined to do this for her. And so Elizabeth, uh, Rhonda sent Elizabeth um, from Open Arms, um, a Indigenous Lactation Consultant to um, help me. And I couldn't have gotten past week two if it hadn't been for Elizabeth. And I was building up to giving myself permission to not breastfeed because for me, it was enough to heal the agency to decide, yeah. to reclaim the agency to decide whether or not I was gonna feed my child um, and how I was gonna feed my child. And once I gave myself permission to not have to do that, I could pump my milk out and feed her the medicine that I wanted to on my terms. Yeah. And so I think that's that was such a um, inner, uh, process of intergenerational healing. And motherhood has just repeatedly taught me about how this is cyclical. <laughs> like this is, this healing is cyclical and it's my mother's healing. It's my grandmother's healings. It's my daughter's healings. Right. Um, I love that story mm -hmm. because, well, because I love you one and two, because colonial thinking teaches us that there's correct ways mm -hmm. to heal. Mm -hmm. And there's the right and the wrong, and there's this prescription and, you know, buy this book or whatever. And both of us healed our chest feeding journeys in really different ways because our ancestral wounds are, are different and our stories are different and our bodies hold different stories of trauma. And so being in right relationship with, with your own unique embodiment of trauma is, is complicated, but it, it also is freeing because you know, you, your intuition is intact. You know, our intuition has never been broken. Mm -hmm. Colonialism and trauma told us it was mm -hmm. and has taught us how to gaslight ourselves, but we know. And so I, I love all the different ways that we're healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think also another layer of that was how um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth constantly reminded me of like, this wasn't meant to be done alone. Yeah. Um, 
these wounds didn't happen just to us as individuals, they happened to our entire lineages, but also our collective and how breastfeeding wasn't meant to be done alone. Like I should have had a mother, a grandmother, aunties, cousins to guide me through this process. Um, it shouldn't have been lonely. Uh, someone else could have chest fed my baby for me if I wasn't able to. Um, I would have been sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, I would have been fed yes. and held. Yes. Um, and there would have been plenty of people to mother my child. Like the pressure wouldn't have just been all on me um, to birth her, to raise her, to keep her alive um, mm -hmm. and to keep myself whole, right? Because yeah. birth is such a, it's the labor of opening, right? Yeah. We open the portal and then we transform. Um, and there's no way to warn mamas about that. <laughs> I know I'm reading as the Hapton cultural history book right now of my people. And it's been so, it's been such strong medicine because it's sharing all the ways in which colonialism stole our communal medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, my people for thousands of years were very particular about how we spaced our babies, the ratio of adults to babies, and all of that's been taken from us. You know, my people historically had a ratio of four adults to one child. And here I am one-on-one -on -one with my baby most days and thinking, what's wrong with me? Come on, right? Or, um, you know, intentional spacing using birth control and um, of, of ensuring that babies are spaced five years apart. That's ancestral medicine. Mm -hmm. And so much of colonialism has taken our access away on purpose to those, to those systems of care. Mm -hmm. um, just affirming that it's okay that I feel bad. Colonialism, that's the point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is for us to feel bad. Mm -hmm. um, and to feel like we're failing. Yeah. Uh, before we go on, does anyone have anything they'd like to reflect on or ask us about? I am just like so overwhelmed with gratitude for for my ancestors and for your ancestors to have weaved together this talk because it is it's been needed for the last two years of my life. Um, he just turned two last weekend, March sixth, and I'm just like I showed up with my little notebook and I'm like I'm gonna take notes and literally like every sentence that's come out of your mouth I need to record. And, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is being recorded. So we will have access to this or can have access to this. And I'm just so grateful to be able to share it with other moms that can be here that I know like need to hear every word like you're sharing right now. Thank you for your vulnerability and your strength um, because it, it just resonates so deeply. Like um, when I had him, I had my son through an emergency C-section that was not planned. and he had a little bit of complications in the beginning where he was in the NICU and I did not want to do formula feed and they didn't, you know, they don't give you an option at that point. So I couldn't latch him when I came home. He was very stubborn. I learned later that kids that are born through C-section need to be taught patience because they didn't have to go through the whole birthing process and like, you know, take it, take their time. So it took, a good eight months for me to like keep pumping and and continue with and I didn't know why the inability to not be able to breastfeed him was so like damaging in my soul like I was so shameful towards my body like and I was so frustrated with him for not being patient and it wasn't until like I started learning these things and also like my mom told me like, you know, I didn't breastfeed you. I went straight back to work when you were born. And then that made sense. Like why I deal with like severe anxiety through my life and how badly I wanted to give him that safety and mm -hmm. that reassurance. And so, yeah, breastfeeding and doing this generational healing, like it makes so much sense what you guys are saying. And I'm just so grateful for it. And I'm ready to just be fully present and I'm going to stop taking notes so that I can really like take in as much as everything that you're saying. It's just, you guys both are such needed medicine and I'm so grateful that 10 minutes before this started, Tema from San Diego posted about it and that I get to be here today. So I'm grateful for all the doulas and all the birth workers and you guys for sharing this medicine. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you for yours. Yeah, Belen. Yeah. Um, oh, so much I could respond to, but let, let's just take a breath and just, I feel like collectively tied to you, like wherever you are. I know you're way in Cali, um, probably enjoying a lot more sun than us. <laughs> um, but this collective mother experience, right? You like it's it was so lonely and yet like there were so many of us feeling lonely and and we were all in this ritual together um Rhonda, mm -hmm. during our um indigenous um birth class talked about how this was a ceremony and um i needed that reminder because white supremacist um culture around birth is one um that is rooted in colonial bs and um just to remember that this is a ceremony that we all were, were participating in across the globe, yeah. right? And that we share this collective endeavor yeah. across the globe as well. Yeah, our collective medicine is strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, should we talk about our own cycles we're healing now? Yeah. Our own mothering cycles? Yeah, you wanna go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can go. I okay. The beautiful thing about healing is that it's collective always. It's not just for us. It's for our lineage and seven before and seven to come. And I went through a really interesting part journey to mothering. I was a uh, you know I'm a survivor of domestic violence I was diagnosed with PTSD in my late 20s as a result I remember the first time I heard someone say I was abuse survivor I thought like shh like don't what no mm -hmm. and so before I was able to name that story I knew I did not want to be a parent that was my medicine for it I just won't do it <laughs> And then I remember I was working in primary care and went into a room with a lactation of consultant um, who was trying to help a mom uh, breastfeed and she was weeping, weeping and she couldn't stop. And they said, you know, call the social worker. Anytime someone cries, they want a social worker. I love tears, tears are strong medicine. I got my tissues. And I said, is it okay while you, you know, take care of yourself that I hold your baby? Mm. Mm. And I took that baby in my arms and I'm telling you my womb opened up, like my whole chemical, like structure of my body changed. I started to salivate. I got really hot and sweaty. The uh, lactation consultant was like, are you like immediately was like, you okay? And I was like, I'm amazing. I'm so good. And I immediately started trying to get pregnant after that day. It was just like, this is my inheritance. This is my true desire. And after about a year of trying, was diagnosed with premature infertility at the age of 28 and 29, 28 or 29. And it was devastating for me. Um, uh, I was told that I wouldn't be able to have children without medical intervention. And this brought up ancestral wounds of infertility and not having access to family planning stories that felt in alignment with our desire. My grandmother who helped raise me told me my whole life, I wanted six children, I got your mom. And that is a beautiful story of her motherhood, but that pain really did infiltrate all of our lives, that pain and that loss um, in the way she would cling to us and, um, and remind us of how precious our life is and how uh, scarce this gift of life is. I really, you know, inherited the story of scarcity in my womb. And what ended up happening because I, uh, I went through a lot of depression, couldn't get out of bed, couldn't eat. And I ended up taking 
joining some indigenous um, medicine around growing our food in indigenous ways. And after that class was over, I got pregnant with my four-year-old, Joel. And that was a beautiful um, time in my life. And I'm very connected with the spirit world as a person. I, I've inherited that from my grandmother. So I immediately felt connected to the story that he brought to our lineage. And I remember the moment I knew I was pregnant. I remember saying to, to him, I trust you. And he said, okay, mom, you're free. And that next month I came out as queer. I stopped attending church. He came here and he was like a cycle breaker in my womb. I, I can't even explain it. It was just like, okay. And now I know he's a very powerful person. He's a very wise person. So it makes sense that he had such a strong voice in my womb. Um, so I got to heal that relationship to my true identity as a queer person and um, heal a lot of shame around that. But also got to stop thinking of myself as a sinner and this horrible broken person with no way of being whole. My son gave that gift to me and um, now I get to give that to him. He, he got to choose his pronouns. Like I, he chose them about a year ago before he was a he, he was, I'm Joel Wepper. Don't call me a boy or a girl, please. And so I think I don't heal like it's not this individual experience. I don't heal the, the generations, the gender, we do this together. Mm -hmm. It's this like collective process. Mm -hmm. um, to make a long story short about infertility, it's been a seven year journey. So I'll speed this up a little bit. I could talk forever. I'm Yakima native, so I could just sit here and talk, talk, talk. Um, I ended up, pursuing like fertility treatment in 2021. And we lost our um, baby Juniper this past June. And again, another power relative, I fell in love with her the second she arrived in my womb. And she said to me, Joel said, you're free. And Juniper said, you get to have peace. Mm -hmm. Because Deanna knows, I was trying to heal my lineage with work. <laughs> That was not, that was not the medicine. Mm -hmm. And Juniper said, you get to have peace. You're enough. You don't have to have three jobs. You don't have to live in scarcity. You're enough. Um, so again, oh, baby's liking that. Yeah, that was sister. Um, so I went into a pretty deep grieving ceremony after I lost Juniper. I let myself weep. I let myself have rage. Diana helped me a lot with ceremony around that. And we had a beautiful ceremony before I tried to get pregnant again in September. And I, oh, November. And I did. And this relative, the ancestral wound, this relative is healing is you get to feel bad. <laughs> you don't have to be the strong one anymore. There's no fix for feeling bad. I lost 10 pounds my first trimester with this pregnancy. I would eat and then throw up. I would wake up and throw up. I would brush my teeth and throw up. I would drive and throw up. And I had all the medicine I needed for this, but this baby was like, no, we're vomiting right now. That's what we're doing and you don't need to fix it. And it's okay to feel bad. You're enough. Mm -hmm. And that has been the strongest medicine of my life. And that is powerful medicine for my lineage because of all the strong people I come from, the resilient people I come from who were never allowed to have a bad day mm -hmm. because we wouldn't, they wouldn't have been able to work. They wouldn't have been able to keep themselves safe in their marriages. So I've had a lot of bad days this pregnancy and it's been really strong medicine. So those are some of my cycles I'm healing. Just a few. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah. Um, well, Jamie was saying earlier that um, Joel, 
she began healing when Joel arrived. Um, and it, it, it was interesting to think of it because I started healing at 22. And I started laying a foundation of healing for um, whoever decided to make their way in the future. But at that time I was like, hell no, I'm never getting, never having a child. Um, I come from my mom, I shared a little bit earlier, who um, did not have choice in becoming pregnant. And I come from my grandmother who had um, 12 children. Um, I don't know how many um, apart from that, but 12 stayed, um, were alive. Um, her first son um, was with a um, man who was of a different social class than she was. Mm -hmm. And so he was taken from her. Um, and raised by his paternal grandmother. Um, and so that is one story that um, really came up with the ancestral intergenerational trauma that I wasn't expecting. Like when Jamie was talking about um, putting her kid on the bus, um, my child being taken away. And it wasn't till I felt that, that I made the connection between my grandmother and her first birth story. Um, and these feelings of um, something happening to my child or being taken away from me. And, um, and so I come from that lineage where my grandmother had a child like every year and a half. Um, and this began when she was a teenager um, and continued on until like her fifties, I think. Um, and so this woman never had choice, never had agency. Um, and I, I don't know her personally, but this is the, the story that I have made sense of. Yeah. Um, and to then have my mother who also didn't have choice, like she had choice in her homeland, um, but once she crossed the border, she lost that choice. Um, and then for me to then have a choice, right? It, it felt like such a weight. And I was immediately like, nope. So I came from a mom um, who had two daughters and I'm, I'm the oldest. Um, so I've been mothering yeah. um, since in vitro, but as soon as this three years later, when my younger sister came into the world and um, I went straight into a parental role for her um, and I entered a partnership role with my mom um, when she split up from my dad. Um, and so mm -hmm. cycles that I've been healing have been about like um, reclaiming my desire to be a mom. Like it was down deep in there, um, but it was taken away from this older sister role, um, from this par early parentification. And from my mom, like her way of keeping me safe um, was to tell me that like the worst thing possible you could do is get pregnant. Mm. And so that was my entire childhood. And she thought that would protect me from sexual activity. She thought that would protect me from sexual abuse, mm -hmm. um, sexual violence. She thought it would give me choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so she prioritized education. She prioritized being financially independent um, rather than motherhood. And so at 22, I had I got married very young. Um, and at 22, when I was with this partner who was respectful, loving, kind, supportive, um, we were having so much tension like at that stage in our relationship. And I knew it wasn't because of him and I needed to go to therapy. Um, but there was no therapist that looked like me. Mm -hmm. um, and there was no therapist that understood the cultural context um, and no therapist that wouldn't tell me like, cut off your mom or, um, and so the, it was a journey of building up to find the therapist that would help me along this healing journey um, that would keep all of the parts of myself whole. And so from 22 to 30, 30, when did I have Cito? Um, around 32, a 10 year, it took me a decade yeah. to move away from hell no, I'm never gonna have a child to calling Jamie up and being like, um, should I have a child? <laughs> and Jamie being like, of course. Um, and I'm like, are you sure? Like, are we ready for this? And I needed her permission to tell me that I had done my healing work up to that point, um, that I could even consider the thought of birthing a child, even though I had wanted around 30, like just the shift happened where I wanted one so bad, but I still didn't feel like I could. I didn't feel like I had healed enough. I didn't think like I could keep her safe. I didn't think I could break these cycles. 
I, my worst fear was that she would end up in therapy just like I was. Um, and so Jamie had to remind me constantly that most likely my child will be sitting in therapy one day and that's okay. <laughs> um, and so the birth of my child, like, um, well, the con conception of my child was very intentional. Um, I wanted her, um, I called for her, um, her dad was there. This is the first um, generation in my lineage um, where the woman had choice about birthing. Um, the woman had a supportive, loving, respectful, nonviolent partner. Uh, this pregnancy was not a result of rape and domestic violence. Um, and so that was a lot to hold, but um, before the conception and when I conceived, I knew immediately. I, I called Jamie, I was like, I know I'm pregnant. I know exactly how it happened, <laughs> when it happened. Um, I know she's in there and I know it's a girl and I know she's here to heal continue healing these cycles. Um, and I feel deeply connected to her. And so I felt, I felt conception happen. I felt my waters come in. I felt um, her presence, like what friend, she was just a tiny cell. And so it was the most beautiful healing pregnancy process, apart from that intense loneliness of the first trimester, which again, I said earlier, did not belong to me. It was not mine to hold. And once I recognized that I could really embrace motherhood and pregnancy and feel like what it was like to be a liberated pregnant person, um, rooted in choice and agency over my life. Um, so that's definitely a huge cycle. Like that's three generations, at least. My great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother on my maternal side, right? me. And, um, then Silo was born uh, and I have a friend um, who recently arrived from Nicaragua who recently immigrated and she tells me, she says, Diana, you relax so much during your pregnancy that you birth the badass. <laughs> and she reminds me that of every day, like yeah. this child is so free. Yeah, she is. She is so bold. Yeah. She is so brave yeah. that I don't know what to do with myself. Um, I don't know how to mother a child who's free, mm -hmm. you know? And I, so I think that's the next, um, the cycle that I'm, I'm holding right now is how do you let your child be free with that when you have been systematically trained intergenerationally to make your daughter small, mm -hmm. uh, to make them strong because they have to be, um, to make them small so that they're not broken by men, by society, um, by white supremacy. Like, how do I love, how do I continue? I loved her so much, so freely in, in my womb. And now that she's out, how do I continue to do that and not make her small? Yeah. Right, because my fear wants me, my, my ancestral wounding wants me to make her small, to be quiet, to behave, mm -hmm. um, to show up in the world in a particularly delicate way. Mm -hmm. And this girl is fire, right? Um, and so that's, that's, that's the next cycle that I have no idea how I'm gonna approach it. <laughs> um, You're doing amazing. And I just constantly have to sit with that yeah. tension of like, this is what I wanted. I wanted a daughter who sassed. I wanted a daughter who spoke up. I wanted an activist. I wanted a revolutionary. And so how do I nurture that now that she's arrived and she's her own self? You wanted to be free. Yeah. Yeah. She, and so that's her gift. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And you are now. Yeah. It's not easy. No. You think you, you, you're working towards this goal of healing, right? There's this no linear goal. goal. There's no goal. Right? Um, like in 10 years, I'll be healed. <laughs> and then you realize like, oh, <laughs> I'm back to where I started. Some of my, <laughs> some of my grandmother's medicine for me is life is a circle mm -hmm. and where are you in your circle? Mm -hmm. And you can, I swear, I, I complete a medicine wheel circle in the span of a minute sometimes where I'm like, whoa. whoa. And sometimes it takes us 10 years ten. and sometimes it takes as many generations, but mm -hmm. we're enough. However, it happens. Mm -hmm. I've also made peace with her going to therapy. 
um, I, I that that has been some of her medicine too because it yeah. realized I realized that I have healed so much for my lineage. Mm -hmm. I have done so much labor yes. to get yeah. us to this place. And so Silonen has her piece too. She mm -hmm. has her piece to contribute to the healing of our lineage, yeah. to the collective well-being. Yeah. And so it's not all on me. And as the oldest daughter, as the partner, as the first person in my family to do so many things, yeah. um, it is such a relief to not have to do it alone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm praying and I'm looking forward to being able to mother her and cultivate this free being, but also um, give myself freedom to not carry that alone anymore. Right. And to be okay with her doing her part. Right. She doesn't have to heal from domestic violence. She doesn't have to deal or heal from um, sexual abuse. At least I will do my best. Yeah, to avoid that. Yeah. Um, so she's got she's got some easier, easier cycles to resolve for our lineage, right? Yeah. Ooh. Strong medicine sitting here with you. Yeah. Let's read some comments. Um, I hope it's okay to share your names. Yes, there's recordings. Um, in 1909. Aotearoa, excuse me, I hope I'm pronouncing things right, colonized mm -hmm. New Zealand legislation called the Native Health Act uh, prevented Maori mothers from breastfeeding. <sighs> of course they fucking did. Government formula was pushed on the mothers mm -hmm. and babies and the babies died. Mm -hmm. And often the only baby in a generation to survive was the one was from the mother who secretly breastfed mm -hmm. a criminal. Wow. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I feel that collective grief. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yes, this will be recorded. Yeah, so powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for sharing the intimacy of your ancestral healing journey, mm -hmm. for calling in these ancestors to your wombs and listening to their calls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to continue mm -hmm. this collective healing for us all. Thank mm -hmm. you, Phoebe. Mm -hmm. I wanted, um, so the reason why I was quiet when we were transitioning from ancestral definitions to oh. cycles oh. is because I was um, thinking a lot about um, uh, Belen's comments earlier mm -hmm. and um, two things that were important for me to talk to bring up um, was um, how you want to remember in order to heal some of these um, ancestral woundings and intergenerational trauma sometimes you have to go back to your own childhood and that's easier to do um, this healing is easier to do when you remember the age you were when yeah. you were struggling with this for the first time. What, and you have to do that by thinking about what age your child is. Um, so excuse me if that was circular, right? We're on native time here. <laughs> um, so when, um, so I had this beautiful pregnancy and then Silonen was born and the hardest nine months of my life happened. Um, well, everything that was, the, the only things I can remember are postpartum. <laughs> So they became the hardest parts of my life. And those nine, those six months were, were very hard for yeah. me. Um, and I felt this disconnection from her, which I was not prepared for. I just felt so disconnected, so zoned out. Um, I would tune her out. I remember I was going to one of Rhonda's medicine gatherings and um, for Mother, no, not for Mother's Day, a different one. And Silo was wailing in the back of the car um, and I was just so zoned out and I show up at this event and I'm not there. Um, I'm an anxious mess trying to calm this three month old baby who's howling. Um, but I, that disconnection made me feel so much shame, mm -hmm. so much shame. And that continued on until I would say nine ish at, at a less extreme, but around nine ish, um, uh, months, I was reading this book called, um, I think it's the book you wish your parents had read. Um, and I only got to this point because like Jamie has said multiple times, like there's only so much healing you can do in a certain span of time. Mm -hmm. And this was a lot for me. <laughs> <laughs> so when this, I think she's a psychiatrist, psychologist, she said, remember the age you were yeah. when you first felt this way. What was happening between your mother, your parent, your caregiver, and you at this stage? And I realized that that's what was the dynamic that was playing out with my mom. 
And it makes absolute sense. I have so much empathy and compassion for her because given all the circumstances that I've shared about um, her birth story and um, the lack of access resources, social support, the isolation, she was far from her mom for the first time in her life when she was pregnant with me and postpartum and she was alone. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I can just imagine how disconnected she felt from that how disconnected, how she was trying so hard to survive um, and get through without any knowledge. Because at that time we didn't have WhatsApp. You couldn't video call, you couldn't FaceTime your mom to ask her, what do you do if this kid is screaming? Um, And so I remember being a very small infant, Mm. like not taking up space, not crying, not Mm. drawing too much attention to me because that put my mom in in danger. and so I feel that on, in, in a deep cellular memory. Mm-hmm. And so when I, when I remember that, I looked at Silo and Silo was about six, um, nine-ish months and it clicked. It was another moment. It was another moment like, oh, this isn't mine. That's my baby. And I felt an instant shift, like a light switch happened and she was mine, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, just remember, like, as you're struggling through this process of mothering a, another being, um, parenting another being, what age were you during this time? Mm-hmm. Like, what age were you when this first showed up? How old were you? Um, so that you can remember what it's triggering in you when mm-hmm. you see your child. Mm-hmm. That is such important storytelling mm-hmm. around healing. Because we trauma is in our bodies right Mm -hmm. it's not this cognitive story it's um it's this cellular memory of how we survived and then we have this next generation arrive with their own story that's separate from us and we want to pull them in oh yeah Rhonda, can i jump in i'm sorry it was i wanted to just share after this thought um But I just, Deanna, as you were sharing of, um, you know, witnessing and holding your baby and um, thinking back to these other moments. And I just wanted to share as as a grandmother um, that there was this other like layer and dimension of healing as, as I witnessed what my daughter then was Mm -hmm. sharing with her child and this next layer of healing of, um, for example, you know, what she brought into her birth experience with confidence, um, the, the absolute, you know, fierce commitment she had to nursing her baby. Um, these, these parts where I see my granddaughter and and I just see this perfection all over again. And, um, and yes, there is this deep grief of, I wish I would have protected this time more closely, or, you know, there were these moments that, um, you know, I was pulled away by life and mm-hmm. that I didn't have. Um, but this, when we're on this conversation of, of just motherhood and, and healing ancestral wounds, I just want to say that, you know, the, that we have this opportunity to make these change, to, to make this change as we parent. And, um, and that now I'm just seeing the, some of the rewards of that. Um, and the, the, the next steps that I, I hope as, as future generations and, and the world, I want my grandmother, my granddaughter to live in and for her children to live in, but there are these just little moments where I have this just breath of hope where I see um, the differences and the choices that that I and commitments I made um, with parenting and you know the hard sacrifices and the hard looking at trauma right in the eyes um, and then I get to see you know the the next chapter of that and so I just wanted to share that um that yes, it's it's profound to see um, and to reparent yourself um, yeah. as you're parenting, um, and and that that process is is so ongoing um, with each with each new you know 
aspect of parenting and, you know, remembering what it felt like to be a teenager and remembering what it felt like um, to just all of those transformations that, that we, you know, try and support our children with, but as they find their own way and they find their own path and they, you know, uh, push against some of the things that you really, you know, desire for them and, and they figure it all out in their own way, um, you know, but, but she does carry different traumas and she does, you know, she's definitely doesn't carry um, a lot of the ones that I fought really hard to keep yeah. away from her life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And Rhonda, I honor you for your role in your granddaughter's like mm -hmm. experience today. Yeah. Um, I think motherhood um, has given us insight into our mothers in ways we could have never <laughs> imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, they gave us so much wounding, but I think about the fact that my mom got us to this country, you know? I think about the financial stability that my mom fought for um, so that Silonen could have a backyard and a garden and access to medicine and um, freedom. Like my mom caused me wounding in many ways. And also she laid the foundation for me to even be able to engage in this healing work. Um, and so every, I think it's very true that every generation uh, puts in its its work and it's um, adds a piece to the puzzle so that we can yes. continue to pass that on. And, and that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, I'm, my mom had me when she was 18 and I am now pregnant when I would have been 18. And my mom says to me often, it's such a joy to watch you parent how I wished I could have. Mm -hmm. And I always say to her, um, I wouldn't be here mm -hmm. being able to have this life without you. Mm -hmm. Because while she was surviving domestic violence, she was telling me, Jamie, have your own money. Mm -hmm. this is how you, this is how we stop this cycle. Mm -hmm. Jamie, you know, you are going to, no one ever has gone to college. You're going, I had no choice. Mm -hmm. There was no mm -hmm. way for me to not go to college. And that was, that now brings me grief mm -hmm. as I'm trying to decolonize all these things. These white people taught me about healing, but it, it gave me this pathway to motherhood through her pain. And now we get to parent these children intergenerationally with so much joy and freedom and in Joel's first year of life she got out of her marriage like he gave us that gift because she saw the peace and the joy that was available to us and um I got my mom back for the first time in 32 years out of this hold of violence and to just watch her heal or even have the opportunity to heal um while grant being a grandparent um is such a tremendous tremendous gift um there's a lot of pain that we're unpacking mm -hmm. um and a lot of wounds that and and um things that are coming up as a result but there's so much celebration it's both are true mm -hmm. all at once mm -hmm. um so thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and now watching, you know, great grandma's going to be here. I have a countdown. On my, she lives in Arizona in the winter and she lives intergenerationally with us in the summer and watching her and Joel together. I just, you know, they play on the floor for hours, right? Like Joel makes my grandmother young and she makes him old and they, they, they are in such celebration with each other's humanity and it's so easy for them. Um, so yeah, the grandparent role, thank you, Rhonda, is very powerful in my life. There's no way I'm here sitting here without my grandma, no way. I got to leave the DV that was in my home every weekend. I got a break every weekend for 18 years. If I did not have that break, there's no way I'm here. There's no way. And um, 
that was the medicine that was available to us at this time at that time um because there was no way for my mom to leave there was no way i thought there was but now that i'm a mother i see that there was not right she had no access to her own agency her own money her own power and that was by design of the relationship <sighs> And Joel got here and said, both y'all are free, <laughs> right? Now unpack some more healing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some more wounding. Yeah. Um, another thing Rhonda mentioned is also how like we're healing different aspects of ourselves, like mm, yeah. simultaneously, like we're healing our baby selves. We're healing our mother selves. We're healing our daughter's self. Um, like I think um, as a small child, I wasn't allowed to say no to my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and now as Silonen's like mother, I get to say no to a lot to my mom. <laughs> but in a lot, in a more balanced way than I was first healing around age 22, where it was like deep freeze at that time where like I needed space and disconnection from you um, because you are an unsafe person for me. Um, versus now uh, um, more than a decade later um, because I have my daughter I can say no um, in a more gentle way um, because I still need to protect my baby self um, as I'm mothering her mm -hmm. I still need to heal my inner child um, um, help her lick her wounds when her mother doesn't show up in the ways that she needs her to or enacts um, more of these, more of this wounding. And I need to be able to do that for myself so that I can interrupt any wounding from getting to my daughter. And my, my mother, I know she has every intention of healing our relationship through our, through yeah. her grandchild. Yeah. Um, she wants my daughter's love so much. She wants a different relationship with my daughter than she has with me. Um, and that's, that's been healing to observe how much she loves her. And also to observe the ways she still unintentionally passes down harm. Um, like she'll do things like, um, she'll say, oh, Silonen doesn't do what she was doing last week. <laughs> Silonen used to do this and she doesn't do this anymore. Um, and that might not seem like much, but it's a lot because <laughs> it's disapproval on my mom, um, on my mom's part towards Silonen experimenting like she's a one-year-old now um and she keeps changing on me <laughs> she keeps becoming freer and I don't think my mom knows how to mother a granddaughter who's free um because she didn't know how to mother a daughter that was free and so it still it still flips her upside down when yeah. she sees this uh, <laughs> this happening and I have to be that protective factor yes. for my daughter yeah and say see London's just exploring yeah yeah. See, Lonan's just exploring. She's figuring out the world. Like that's okay. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that rubs her wrong and, and I have to be okay um, with doing that as a mom because it wasn't done for me. Yes. Yes. I um, am a trauma therapist recovering from infertility, grief, and PTSD. And, mm -hmm. and I'm a have had a young toddler in quarantine for two years and so my house reflects that <laughs> and my mom comes over and she's like this place is a mess like how are you living how are you surviving lots of disapproval messages mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you must feel so ashamed all of this stuff and finally I called her back I called her and I said mom you are welcome to my home anytime we have a no-knock policy I'm I've always me meant that my home is your home, you know, and I have a mess as a green light to myself that I am prioritizing my health and my mental health and my parenting over all else. And if that's all I can do, then that's all I can do. And she said, I drove away and I regretted shaming you. And I realized I had deep grief about how I had to have my house clean over being a mother. Mm -hmm. Because if her, if our home was not clean at all times, she would get more violence. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this moment of like, fuck, like 
even a messy house is triggering mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. right? And like how we are in relationship to our space and what was taken from her. Mm-hmm. She was like, I would have done anything to just spend four hours on the floor with you playing. And I never got to do that, but I can do that now with Joel. And I said, yeah, and you don't have to pick it up at the end. <laughs> like You can leave it, I can do it. Mm-hmm. So to realize like so much of that disapproval is their own trauma response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it cracks me up. There's this memory. So um, I went back to work when Zilonen was about four months old. Um, and I was at a girlfriend's house right before um, that weekend. And I took this picture of Zilo and she's lying in this leather recliner. And the le- leather recliner is beat up. It looks bad. Um, but it was the cutest thing because she fit right in the therapist chair. <laughs> um, so I, I posted it on, on social media and I said, your therapist is back in office and I shared it. And then I get a call from my mom. Um, and my mom says, you should be embarrassed. I would never post a picture of my granddaughter in such a state. And I'm like, immediately, like just this bucket of cold water hits me. And I'm like, small, I'm making myself small, which is what I do in our relationship. And I'm immediately like ashamed and I don't even know what I'm ashamed about. All I know is that I did something wrong and my body is responding exactly to that. Um, and so I, I asked her like, what are you saying? Like, what are you talking about? And she's like, you, you posted that picture of Silonen in that ugly chair. Like, aren't you embarrassed? Um, and I was like, thank you for calling just to let me know. I will speak to you later. And I hang up the phone, I took a breath and I call Jamie and I'm like, Jamie, you will never know what my mom just did. You will not believe what this woman did. And it's so true. Like my mom grew up so poor where like people's opinion of you was just meant your survival, everything, everything to her, like people's opinion, her family's opinion, their approval, because she's so used to making herself small in those relationships. And she knew that if they were these pictures were on social media that people would get a wind of it and then that they would be talking in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. about how her how is it possible that her granddaughter um, is living like in such impoverished conditions (laughs) because the worst thing possible is poverty yeah um and so we can laugh about it now but in those moments like you're just shocked Mm -hmm. about how quickly you fall back into these like ancestral woundings yeah Right. And, yeah. and how you're constantly burnt by the wounds of your mother that then trigger your own wounds that then like respond to each other. And the trigger was way back. Who knows how many generations and it's been passed on. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a trip, this healing mm-hmm. and mothering this mama medicine that we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. <sighs> But yes, our current healed selves get to transcend these times and show up for our past selves who needed us during these trauma- traumatic events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Belen. thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Miranda, do you think we should keep going or do you wanna open it up for questions? I think um, yeah. I feel like we should answer maybe one more question just to close full circle. Um, Okay. Our testimony. Yeah. And then how do you feel about opening it up after? That sounds perfect. Okay. Okay. I just think this question is really important. Um, Just to give ourselves credit for the labor that we have done, (laughs) um, not only in birthing these children, but rebirthing ourselves um, and our lineages. Um, So what medicine, dear sister, did you bring to your people? One of my earliest childhood, I'm a griever. I was born with grief medicine. Thank goodness, because I've had a lot of grief to offer myself in our lineage. And I, one of my earliest memories, there's, there was so much violence in my household. I would often go and hide to get away. And I would bury my face in the carpet and I would weep and I would cry and I would, I would shake. And I remember thinking my earliest memory was there has to be an easier way to do this. Mm -hmm. This is the hard way. Mm -hmm. And that is my medicine for my lineage is 
is healing and ease mm -hmm. and doing uh, everything every choice I make right now is about that mm -hmm. is about the second my grandmother needs something for her health I'm gonna have it for her mm -hmm. she won't have to think twice about where she's gonna get that and living in abundance mm -hmm. um when my mother was facing whether or not to leave and she was so scared, I can't afford it. I can't do it. I won't be able to do it. How am I going to have a home? I said, you will live with me. There is enough. We live in abundance. We're, in, we're indigenous. We live in abundance. Ease is our medicine because women have struggled in my lineage for years, just keeping us alive, keeping us safe, keeping us small. And now I just... I feel greedy for ease <laughs> and I'm so grateful to be in, in, in like, just you're in my collective. Cause you helped me remind me of that. Cause I say that it's a lot easier said than done. Totally. I like a lot of hardship, <laughs> you know, I was taught that struggle made me safer and it made me more valuable as a human being. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that I'm enough when I am doing nothing, mm -hmm. when I'm resting, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's just an easier way. There's an easier way to live. Um, and I brought that healing to my, my mamas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of, I, I run out of words to answer that question. Um, like, I think you spoke to abundance, right? My people have generational struggles with scarcity. My, my grandmother, my great grandmother owned half of the, the land um, um, which Granada was built on. She, my maternal great grandmother owned and she signed away the rights to her land by signing an X because she didn't know how to um, write her name. Um, and on my paternal side, my, my grandmother also, um, lost all of the generational wealth that she had built for my father and his siblings. Um, and so by the time um, I was born, my people had struggled with scarcity, um, economically, um, systemically, like um, Nicaragua is one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and that is an intentional systematic um, curtailing of resources and exploitation. Um, but I think becoming, going to grad school, like made me free enough to jump ship and start my own business and live a life um, of leisure. I, Jamie and I have a hard time because we're such workaholics and that is the lineage <laughs> inheritance that we have. And we, we're constantly working each other up to take vacation and to have peace. But the fact that I don't have to go to a nine to five, the fact that I'm not on my knees, like cleaning houses, mopping floors and being paid a dollar an hour or not being paid at all because my bosses are exploiting and taking advantage of me, which was very much my mother's experience. The fact that I'm not dependent on a man for money um, has healed my grandmother's, um, my grandmother's experience. Um, and the fact that I can give my child an inheritance where um, I don't think I'll be investing in a college fund um, because I don't want her to go to college if that's not where her heart is. Um, but the fact that we can even talk about money and investments in that way um, <laughs> and, no <college. laughs> and no college, what? Like my mom would die if I had to come home and said that because that was my one mission in life that was going to make her proud. And, and so I, I almost killed myself doing it, but yeah. I did it for her. Um, but now I don't want that for my child. I want her to be free and I want her to experience the abundance of her bank account but also the land and live in reciprocity um, and reclaim this medicine. Um, I took her out. Um, I planted, as soon as we got a plot of land, I planted 10 fruit trees and I took her out to the plum tree yesterday um, because it's the first one that flowers. And I just thought about the joy of being in right relationship, like with yourself, but also with the land um, and being able to like, work and then go out and play in my garden and, and cultivate medicine and be, and talk to my plants. Um, yeah. And so I, I just think my life is so abundant, like in terms of relationships, 
I, I mentioned multiple times the loneliness I felt. My daughter turned one on the eighth and I did the biggest blowout ever. Um, I never thought I'd be that parent, but post pandemic, like <laughs> I invited all of just my family, just the people I have intentionally cultivated to, that love me and that I love never endingly. And they all showed up for Silo. They all showed up. And so that house was like, how many people? Like at least 50 people showed up. Um, like a hundred. And then like all these kids. <laughs> um, and my Silonin was in a mood. She did not want to party yeah, at all not. because she she never seen so many people in her life. And I just like, I was, it was midnight that night and I'm staring at the ceiling and my eyes won't shut because I don't know what to do with such a loving presence, such an abundance of love and sisterhood and family um, and all of us healing, all of us healing, all of us doing our work and enjoying. and enjoying life and experiencing abundance for the first time. And who knows how many generations in our lineages. And I got to share that with so many people. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I think that comes full circle to just the medicine that we brought for our, each other, for ourselves, for our baby. Yeah for our collective, for the world, for the earth, for Pachamama. Um, yeah. And a promise that we're gonna carry this on so that our children don't have to fight for this, so that they don't have to struggle with imposter syndrome or doubt their identity or their, their indigeneity or their medicine. Yay. Ah. All right, questions or comments or any reflections about your own medicine, the, your, the wealth and all, all of your DNA, our collective DNA, we inherited that too. And I just wanna remind anyone who does not wish to be in the recording, just say that to the camera and it will be edited out. Um, and so I just wanted to share that, um, and that, that we will honor that. Um, I just wanted to share that one of the strongest things that I felt through your presentation is, is how many times that you looked at each other or talked about times when you called each other or, you know, were reminded about, you know, we've, we've, we've made these choices, we've made these commitments and, um, and that you've both had the support and the sounding board and the um, ability to have joy. And so one of the strongest things that came through for me is how important these relationships can be as parents, um, you know, and, and in, in all these different times um, where there are sometimes we, we want to seek those who have who've been on that journey before us and other times where we just really, you know, connect to those who are uh, in our, that phase of life. And so I, um, I just really felt the joy and, um, and the connection that you have. And I appreciated just getting a glimpse of that and, in, and just want to echo that we all need that. You know, we all need that. And it's been, you know, like I think of midwifery students who need to, who need to process with other midwifery students and, you know, um, grandparents who need grandparents and, um, you know, se just seeking out all of those different um, relationships that, that feed us and, um, and, you know, that we, we need those and we need to, to prioritize those relationships. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And it's trauma and colonialism and white supremacy will have you believing this lie of individualism. Um, and we internalize that thinking we need to have it all together and that we need to do it alone, that our healing is alone, that mothering is alone, that parenting is alone, um, aging, being a grandparent, like reclaiming, all of this has to be done alone. And that's the biggest lie um, that we need, we need to go back to the collective. Yeah and that connection. We deserve love. Mm -hmm. We deserve right relationship. I remember receiving Jenna's love in the beginning was so painful for me because of the mother wound. And I had been shown that survival is about, about lateral violence mm -hmm. and like protecting mm -hmm. like yourself over anything else. And I'd seen my mother abandoned by so many people. Mm -hmm. And I thought Jenna's like fierce love. I was like, remember how scared I was? <laughs> <laughs> and to just like the healing of like I deserve safe good love and I'm worthy of that and I don't have to perform for that mm -hmm. 
um, was one of the biggest healing moments of my life because mm-hmm. I can, sh- I have that medicine now and I can, sh- I can mm-hmm. share it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my fierce attachment wounds about abandonment were like, I refuse to let you abandon me. <laughs> <laughs> you are mine. <laughs> yeah. So there's a question. Okay. Do you think healing and forgiveness go together? Mm -hmm. Struggle at times with ongoing colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy, state mandated peace and reconcile. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. How do you forgive when harm hasn't stopped? You don't, you, (laughs) this is about, okay. I, as a DV survivor, who's estranged from their father, very proudly, I have not, I have healed immensely without forgiving him because Mm -hmm. the violence has not stopped. Mm -hmm. He is in, yeah, he has been asked many times how to, and he refused. That's not my work. I'm not going to do his work for him. And I really do extend that out to colonialism, but that's my relationship with my healing. Mm -hmm. I've needed to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. I lived with so much shame and blame. I was the reason coming into this world when my parents weren't prepared. Um, I, I I took on so much of the blame for the violence that I have to forgive myself. And that feels really important to me, Mm -hmm. but forgiving colonists, I don't have any interest in that. Mm -mm -mm. I, I was just having this conversation with uh, one of my clients who feels like they have to forgive their dad and that they have to do it before their dad passes away. Um, And that's been the messaging they've received from a lot of women in their families. And so I had to have a a talk about um, systems, right? If you think about um, these systems that we, that influence our lives, like church, like religion, um, like the state, they're constantly asking Mm. women to forgive. Yeah. They're constantly asking women to turn the other cheek, be the other person and the strength, be the strength, um, turn the other cheek. And isn't that interesting? Isn't that convenient? Isn't that convenient to the patriarchy um, that this is an expectation? Yeah. And rage is part of the grief, Mm -hmm. grief process. Rage is protective Mm -hmm. for my humanity. Mm -hmm. I have to pay attention to when it becomes corrosive to me. Mm -hmm. I want to be in right relationship with rage, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to disinherit my right to rage Mm -hmm. because of any guilt Mm -hmm. that I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Rage has given me tremendous medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, man. And freedom. Yeah. And I, I want to just add that there have been a lot of relationships that I look at and I think, um, you know, that the, the stopping harm is that that first step if you have if you have any burn and you want to to treat that the the first step is always going to be you know to no longer you know be in that vat of hot water um and that that's that first step but then um i found a lot of healing with people who i wish could recognize or um admit or at least just see how what the how they've impacted me and I've I've come to this it was actually Jada Pinka Smith who just talked about capacity and and that um what we can do is is look and say you is that 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 people will be brought often as far as their capacity as they'll allow their capacity to go and so I can forgive I can forgive and I can, I can move on without having, um, you know, the, these, these people or these experiences be explained or healed because I can recognize that where their capacity ends is not where mine needs to exist. Um, And I can move beyond that capacity. And I think of the, the energy of, of springtime and how, you know, there's, it takes a lot of ferocious, just, strength and fearness to be you know that seed that has to push its way through the darkness of the earth and you know come through into the light and um and that if we stay in that place of you know of 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 circle circular non-healing non-moving from um to to truly just move on 
um, and leave behind what is no longer serving us, we can just stay there. You know, we would, we would just stay there and never, you know, rise through. Um, and so I think sometimes these reconciliation circles, these, you know, um, grievance procedures, mediation meetings, um, that there, it, it gets to this point where it's a, um, you know, is this actually to keep me yeah. underneath the yeah. soil? Um, uh, yeah. And and when you recognize, um, mm-hmm. okay, this is all the further this relationship can can exist in, and mm-hmm. but it it doesn't mean that's where I need to stay. No, thank you for that, Rhonda. Mm-hmm. And I I have been clear to my lineage, like my choice, my boundary is not my child's choice. Like I trust in his capacity to build in any relationship that he needs to with my protection, but maybe my father will have a different level of capacity with him. I, I, I'm open to that. Um, but for me, you're right. Like I gave myself permission to sort of leave that mediation table, that seed metaphor. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much I could say on that, but I want to honor another, um, kind of request in the chat. Um, and I think what I'm going to take away from that is um, the topic of mental health and the inter- intergenerational uh, legacy of mental health, like when our parents are unwell and how that creates disease and illness in us. Um, and so for a lot of survivors of domestic violence, of intergenerational trauma, um, historical trauma, like the research is showing how like our DNA is significantly altered with each generation. And we can be generations removed from the act um, and a lot of silence in between. So then we don't know where this anxiety stems from, where this depression stems from, or this trauma response stems from. Um, And so yes, it does impact the next generation because then it impacts how you can parent, how you can connect with your child. Um, But it doesn't have to be the end all. I mean, like, I think we're both anxious in different ways. Um, and depressed in different ways. Um, and this pandemic has not helped that. Um, and so we never we never enter the therapeutic relationship saying we're healed. Wow. Like we we intentionally laugh at that because we are we are constantly in a healing process alongside the people we're working with. Um, and so our babies feel some of that, mm-hmm. right? And we can do our best to try to protect them from all of that, but they're being mothered by, um, by anxious mamas. And so just honoring yourself and your struggle, I think is such a, the, one of the first interventions, right? Like I am anxious because my people were harmed. Yeah. Right. And and really nurturing that, um, self-compassion, um, has really interrupted that inheritance inheritance for my daughter. Um, I practice a lot of deep breathing, a lot of groundedness, a lot of, um, a lot of medicine. I have um, a lot of protection and I did throughout my pregnancy with her, which is why my friend laughs at me and says like, you did so much deep breathing that this child came out fearless. <laughs> um, so it might backfire, but I think, um, yeah, I think I, that's good medicine. Baylan, I think you're speaking to like, I, as a, I'm still a child in this body, mm-hmm. I'm still a teenager mm-hmm. and my mom's mental health uh, was significantly impacted mm-hmm. by living with domestic violence. And so when I can't get out of bed and my mm-hmm. son wants to play with me, I'm right back there. Mm-hmm. I'm five, mm-hmm. six, seven, mm-hmm. eight again. And Joel doesn't know that. Mm-hmm. Right. But I bring that story to him and to us. Mm-hmm. And so I name that pain because mm-hmm. I couldn't as a six-year-old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. And those wounds that you have are sacred mm-hmm. and you survived it. And now you get to be with it and your child is teaching you a story about that. Mm -hmm. And there are days where I cannot play. Mm -hmm. I'm too depressed. Mm -hmm. And I give myself that grace and that compassion, like Deanna said, and I tell my son, sweetie, mommy's energy and her body is low and Mm -hmm. I am restoring it Mm -hmm. with rest, Mm -hmm. right? Would you like to rest with me or can I lay down with you somewhere or I can call in a relative? And some days he he has to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And so I teach him about disappointment and disappointment in our our relationships. And I don't, and some days it's messy and lots of times I have to go back and I have to say, sweetie, 
I did this thing that I can tell hurt you. Mm-hmm. Can, can, can we name that together? Can I try again? I'm ready to play now. What do you want to play? And our love, our love from our children is abundant, mm-hmm. right? They mm-hmm. are full of just mercy and, and, and good, good medicine mm-hmm. from they're so close to the spirit world, right? Mm-hmm. They have all that power with them. Mm-hmm. And so I really appreciate you calling that out because mm-hmm. it can feel terrifying to say, to think like, I, I barely survived that. What will happen if I do that again? Mm-hmm. It's a if real thing. It on. Yeah, it's a real, real thing. Mm-hmm. I think I've never seen someone be more intentional than Jamie in mothering. And just so like earlier before we got to this presentation, so much patience. I was already ready to lose it. Um, And it wasn't even my child. Like my child is screaming on the other end of the house. (laughs) Um, But just the intentionality of breaking this inheritance um, is something I admire so much in you and has freed me to be able to be more communicative in my love for my child. Um, I constantly tell her how much I love her, how much this isn't hers, yeah. how it doesn't belong to her. I free her yeah. um, from this anxiety. I free myself from being small. Um, I free myself from my mother's wounds. And I, I know we talked a lot about mother wounds, but we also have papa wounds. We have, and, and we don't even, some, me and Jamie sometimes don't even touch on that lineage. Um, <laughs> later, maybe later. <laughs> maybe, maybe when we're dead. <laughs> um, but I haven't had to be in relationship with my dad to um, forgive him for being an orphan child who didn't know how to be in relationship with women. Um, and to skip over him to be in relationship with my paternal grandmother um, because she's the one who showed up to me over and over again during my pregnancy. And so I know I healed that lineage. I know I healed that lineage um, without having to interact with this parent that I'm not ready to heal with. Sweet grass medicine. Uh, well, we were going to bring our. Well, um, we're, we were going to bring our medicine in, but he joined us earlier than planned and has now departed. <laughs> um, but I think I just want to honor that you have already interrupted um, mental health inheritances yeah. by speaking them out loud yes. and by being compassionate towards yourself. And I have seen you hold that baby. I've seen you love on that baby this entire time. So um, really honor the fact that your love is medicine for this child. Um, and I see it, I see it all the way from here. Yeah. Yeah, we're enough, we're enough always. Yeah. Should I bring them in? Okay, I'll be right so, back. I don't know if they're gonna come. Four-year-olds have their own agenda that is not ours. <laughs> Would you like to share your name? Or do you want me to talk for you? Oh. <laughs> How old are you? Oh, Thank God. you for sharing your mothers with us today. Oh. We appreciate that. It's been a long time since I've seen her. She was, <laughs> I think. Say hi, Zima. Hola. Uh, no. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, both of you. And um, I just wanted to share that, um, uh, just to be clear that these Recordings are edited and um, uh, made available in multiple formats for anyone who would like to do that. We, I think today's the 25th episode. Um, so we have conversations on, you know, placenta teachings and, you know, cradle boards and um, healing after cesarean and, um, you know, uh, we, there, uh, Ibu Robin was here today and, um, you know, shared also, we talked about global midwifery in one episode. Um, and so uh, 
you know, anyone who would like um, more of those, any parents, I also want to make sure that you are aware that we're going to Zoom at noon on Wednesdays. Um, and so for Center for Indigenous Midwifery, we are just working to support Indigenous families and um, as well as, um, you know, supporting more birth keepers in a lots of different ways. Um, but in particular, if you are a, um, a family, um, we do have our weekly Zoom at noon every Wednesday uh, with different topics each week, as well as our childbirth ed programs. Um, and so I hope to see you at um, a future date and I thank you all, whether you are loving on families or growing your own or struggling your way through every single moment. Um, uh, you're, we thank you for, for honoring that work and, um, and you're appreciated and you, um, you, you deserve to be appreciated and held and loved through this, these parenting journeys. So thank you all. And I hope you had a, a great day. Uh, we honor your story and the connections to ours. It's been such a blessing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rhonda, for trusting me and, and letting me bring my best friend along. Um, but so much blessings for you all. And may you experience abundance for you and your lineage. Adios. Adios. Okay. Adios. Adios. Thank you all. Adios. <laughs> Bye. Yes. Thank Does you. Do you want to play with me now? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Bye. Adios. Adios.